Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arya Majumdar, and I'm the Dean of Admissions at OP Jindal Global University. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that you're all at home, safe, and in the best of health. As students, faculty, staff, and members of the greater education community, you may have all recognized the importance of staying engaged and looking to the future with a sense of optimism and a sense of possibility during these extraordinarily difficult times for our country and the world. While we remain in isolation and confinement in the coming days, many of us may face difficulties, uh, including managing daily life under lockdown, caring for family members and loved ones, and maintaining our physical and mental well-being. In the midst of this crisis, we may find solace in renewing our commitment to our respective areas of interest and scholarship while also seeking out new and unexplored subject areas. Including the ability to work remotely. As people adapt to achieving efficiency while working remotely, new economic opportunities will arise. And so will the demand for a new kind of workforce. As more and more people are forced to work online and remotely, companies and employees are developing new skills and comfort levels with technology. Companies will really learn what jobs need to be done and will attempt to re-engineer the workplace. This might result in many jobs being cut and redefined. Some careers may vanish in its entirety. We know that businesses will be reshaped in the future in a post-coronavirus world. So how do you prepare yourself for a brave but uncertain future. Today, we will be talking about some key skills that may be useful for the careers of the future. Have you heard of the Swedish gentleman by the name of Felix Gjellberg? No? How about PewDiePie? PewDiePie is a YouTube gamer. People view his videos, but must first watch an ad or two which contributes to his revenue. He makes approximately 140,000 to 1.4 million US dollars a month. Closer to home, India's Bhuvan Bham is believed to earn three to four lakh rupees from each of his BB Key Vines video on an average. Chiara Ferragni, an Italian fashion blogger known for her blog, The Blonde Salad, was ranked first on the Forbes top fashion influencers list. She takes home about $8 million from her blog, and she recently set up her own shoe business. 10 years back, the uh, idea of a career gamer or a YouTuber or a social media influencer didn't exist. In fact, even now, parents and teachers will consider gaming to be a pastime or a distraction from students' core activity, which still remains studies. These examples of PewDiePie and Bhuvan Bam aren't to encourage you to all become YouTubers. A fact that for every one Bhuvan Bam, there are thousands, perhaps even millions of people who've tried their hand at being a social media influencer and have failed. However, these are just examples of an ever-changing world of what could be a career and what careers will eventually die out. 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030 haven't been invented yet. What this means for young millennials, such as yourself, such as yourself, is that there is a high degree of uncertainty as to which jobs are here to stay and which are coming up on the horizon. In this scenario, how do you prepare for a brave but uncertain future? The first step is to dissociate your training from your career. I'm sure you've all seen three idiots. What do engineers usually do after their engineering degree? Most of them appear for the CAT and go on to do an MBA and eventually become an investment banker. There is hardly a correlation between engineering and investment banking, except that they both require a very high quantitative aptitude. Steve Jobs, the founder and chairman of Apple, had a liberal arts degree 
not a degree in computer science. Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, doesn't have an MBA. In fact, he has a BA in English. As a matter of fact, he applied to Harvard 10 times and each time he failed. Closer to home, I myself trained as a lawyer for five years, then practiced as a lawyer across New York, London, and Delhi for seven years. But right now, the job that I do requires more people skills than lawyering skills. Take Mayim Bialik, for example, from the Big Bang Theory, right? She earned her PhD in neuroscience from the University of California, and then went on to play a neuroscientist on the show. Rebel Wilson has actually a law degree and moved on to acting as well. Sandeep Sridharan, who owns the restaurant Modern Coastal in Mumbai, started out as a consultant and later switched paths to the culinary arts. Trained as a software engineer, Pragya Bhatt worked in the IT industry for more than eight years before she switched paths to teaching yoga full time. Even Kenny Sebastian has a bachelor's degree in visual arts from Chitrakala Parishad, and now he's known to us as a world-class stand-up comedian. Your school education should provide you with a wide enough grounding in a variety of subjects. Your college education should provide you with a bit of specialization. But here's the key point. That specialization doesn't necessarily have to define you. Once we've identified the fact that we can dissociate our training, our college education from our careers, the second step is to develop key skills which are transferable across sectors and functions. Different people have different ideas on what these skills should be. Today, I want to talk about my core list of seven skills which I believe are invaluable for the future. The first, an intellectual curiosity, an urge to learn new things continuously. This leads to an acquisition of general knowledge of the world around us and how it works. But more importantly, it develops the skills to ask questions as to what is it that I'm observing? And the thing I'm observing, why does this thing behave in the way that it does? Now, it could be something as simple as observing a bright orange ball rise in the sky each morning, which quickly turns yellow. We know it's the sun, but the idea of what am I looking at and how does it work are key indicators of intellectual curiosity. And that really lies at the very core of the scientific method of inquiry, which has led us to huge developments, both technological and social political and economic. The second key skill is that of critical thinking. This is the natural progression from having an intellectual curiosity. Once you've started observing things around you and started questioning why things the way they are, we now begin to apply that knowledge to our decision-making process. At the core of critical thinking is a very simple idea. And that idea is, assume nothing. Once you start at this position of assuming nothing, you then start collecting data which will both support and disprove your arguments. Then, based on that data, you take a decision taking into account multiple perspectives, including that of the people who may disagree with you, including that of the people who will be affected by that decision. And of course, you must always, always question the logic behind your own decision. The third core skill that I consider to be very, very important is that of interpersonal skills. Now, I am reaching out to you through the marvel of modern technology. Eventually, we'll all have systems where computers will regularly talk to each other. We already have had a glimpse of the future in the idea of Internet of Things where internet-connected smart fridge will order for eggs and milk from grofers the moment it senses that you're low on milk and eggs. However, social interactions are very difficult to automate, and it is likely that people will have to continue talking to each other. 
The key to great interpersonal skills is great communication. What will matter is not only how you communicate your ideas, but also how you negotiate, influence, and most importantly, listen to what others have to say. Versatility is another one of my key core skills. We are bound to see changing trends in the market from here on after this global pandemic. What a successful pe person needs then is to be able to adapt to quick to changes in a quick environment, in a quick manner. This requires the determination to ride the wave and use and new and use new opportunities. It also includes the ability to reskill and upskill and cater to changing times. For this, being versatile is absolutely essential. At OPG Global University, we see a diversity of not just faculty members, but also of students. This again becomes a key skill for diversity and cultural intelligence. In a world where everything is connected, people have greater access to mobility, both physical as well as intellectual. As a result, we end up in a world where workplaces have become more diverse and open. In this world, it is vital that individuals have the skills to understand, respect, and work with each other, despite differences in race, culture, age, gender, sexual orientation, political, or even religious beliefs. The sixth core skill that I have for you is that of service orientation. Many of our processes may be handed over to machines in the future, but the human touch is something that people will always want. Customers will still want to deal with actual humans. Service orientation is the ability and desire to anticipate, recognize, and meet others' needs, sometimes even before those needs are articulated. Service-oriented people focus on providing satisfaction and making themselves available to others. This was defined as actively seeking ways to help other people. How much do you assist those on your team, your superiors, your juniors, the people across your industry? How much are you known for that? In the everyday world around us, services are and have been commonplace for as long as civilized history has existed and will continue to be crucial in the future. My last, seventh and the last core skill that I find to be critically important for careers of the future is that of having an ethical aptitude. We shouldn't forget one of the key behavioral traits that separates us from animals, a moral compass. How we apply moral principles to professional situations speaks a lot about who we are as individuals. Whether we care about more than just profits, whether we care about sustainability, and whether we care about our decisions and how our decisions affect people around us. Of course, it must be said that ethical decisions are often the most difficult to take and developing the skills to be determined enough to take an ethical decision, no matter how unpopular, becomes really, really important. So those were my seven key skills on, on figuring out how to survive in a brave and uncertain world. I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm now going to move to some of the questions that you've asked and we look at some of the questions and figure out if we can answer some of the most common questions. I have a question on uh, inputs for people in academia. Well, I shifted from an industry, I used to work in a law firm, I moved from the industry to academia about seven years back, and I can say, uh, with um, utmost belief that academia is a wonderful place to be. You're constantly researching, you're constantly on the cusp of human knowledge, and you're constantly pushing the boundaries of human knowledge. At this point of time, I can, I can say that research and teaching and administration are things that, that really are um, target-oriented, they are tangible, and you get a lot of, of, um, of peace and solace in dealing with children, in dealing with students on a daily basis.
I have a question from Mr. Manmohan Singh. Why do you think AI, how much do you think AI will replace human work in the legal field? Well, Mr. Singh, I, I am I'm given to understand that IBM has already created an AI um, backed lawyer. Now, I believe that artificial intelligence will take up a, quite a bit of work on the legal front, whether it is drafting of documents, whether it is due diligences, whether it is um, working out strategies for negotiation or for litigation. But at the end of the day, this means that lawyers will have time for more important things. Lawyers will have time to do the things that they would otherwise not be able to in the workplace because they're tied up in figuring out what drafts to use, what litigation strategy to adopt, what negotiation strategy to adopt, so on and so forth. Mansi Anand um, writes, will a journalism degree hold much credit in the coming future? Absolutely. We've seen a number of questions about what to believe and what not to believe. A lot of questions are coming up about fake news, right? And whether or not we should believe in the WhatsApp forwards or the SMSs or messages from our, um, from our relatives, from our friends, from people we know. Again, go let's go back to the first and second skill the first skill was on having an intellectual curiosity and the second skill simply says assume nothing right so now if we take these two skills if we take these two principles right and we apply it to what we see in the world around us what we are seeing on news channels what we're seeing in newspapers and you assume you start by assuming nothing in which case, when you watch a news video or you read a news article, you must question that did this event actually happen? If it's on video, chances are it did. But then, as we all know, videos can be doctored. Is there enough evidence? And is that evidence growing from different parts of the world, from different journalists, from different parts of India, that this event that is happening is actually happening, right? In which case there, at that point of time, you're gathering data. And based on that data, you must make a decision whether or not to believe. To come back to the original question, that will a journalism degree hold much credit in the coming future? Absolutely. A journalist is absolutely key to getting facts out to the masses. And it is this key aspect of journalism that you report the facts and perhaps provide your opinion. Right? But facts have to be facts. They have to be proven. And you again start at that skill of assuming nothing. And that's where journalists, irrespective of whether somebody is, is reliant more on social media rather than the print media, journalists, I believe, will continue to play a role um, in the future. I have a few questions. I have a ah, I have a very interesting question. What made me shift from law to academia? Simply put, um, I wanted a different challenge. I wanted new challenges. That's what I thrive on. Um, and even today, um, I started teaching law at the General Global Law School, um, which, by the way, has been ranked the number one law school in India by QS. Um, I still teach corporate law. At the, OP Jindal, at the OP Jindal University in the Jindal Global Law School. And again, constantly, I, I like challenging myself all the time. We have a lot of questions about the university vision and the global connects that we have. Um, our, let me, instead, of, instead of answering that question, let me, let me tell you a story. This is a story of a young lawyer, um, sometime around the turn of the century, who finds himself at um, the NYU Law Library. And he's going through some books and he says, and he thinks to himself, well, I'm a student at Harvard. He was a student at Harvard and he was at the New York Law Library. He, he thought to himself, I'm a student at Harvard, which is a private university. Um, why aren't private universities in India thought to be as, as amazing as private universities in the United States? And he set about, and this was a thought that he had. 
he set about his business. He um, joined a law firm. He taught uh, at a, a number of universities um, in Japan, in Hong Kong. But this thought never left him. And it was a burning desire for this young lawyer to set up a university in India, a private university in India, that would be regarded as one of the best, perhaps not, not just in India, but perhaps even the world. And he met, and he had the fortune of meeting the then law minister, Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj, who then got him introduced to Mr. Naveen Jindal, an industrialist and chairperson of GSPL. Mr. Naveen Jindal and this young lawyer, now I, I think you know who this young lawyer is. His name is Professor Dr. C. Raj Kumar, and he was the founding vice, he's the founding vice chancellor of OP Jindal Global University. Professor C. Raj Kumar and Mr. Naveen Jindal had a number of meetings, had a number of talks, and had figured out that there could be the possibility of a university in India that would be private, not for profit, and have academic freedom. And in 2009, we started our first school, the Jindal Global Law School, with 10 faculty members and 90 students. Today, we are at nine schools with 5,100 students and 571 faculty members, giving us a faculty student ratio of one is to nine. Just to think, just to put things in perspective, the UGC recommends a faculty student ratio of about one is to 18. We believe that a faculty student ratio is absolutely critical. It gives us the teaching excellence that we, we at OP General Global University, we strive to achieve. A smaller um, a faculty student ratio will result in more individualized teaching will result in smaller classrooms. Teaching excellence is one of the key factors or one of the key cornerstones on which OP General Global University is based. The second is that of research. Our faculty members are at the forefront of research and they're constantly pushing the boundaries of human knowledge within the space of arts, humanities and the social sciences. And it's not just our faculty members. Our students often engage with faculty members and assist them in their research. There have been countless examples of where our students and faculty members have co-authored academic papers in leading academic journals across the world. The third cornerstone of our university is that of interdisciplinarity. Harvard Kennedy Public, Public Policy School. The Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Law School are one kilometer apart. There is no way for a student at the Harvard Law School to take up a public policy course in the Harvard Kennedy School. Fortunately for us, all of our schools are housed in one large academic block, all nine of them. And all nine schools and all 571 faculty members and all 5,100 students all live, work, and eat, and study, and, work, and play, all in the same campus. This gives us the ability to have cross-listed electives and interdisciplinarity. For example, a student of law might be interested in corporate law and therefore might take up a course on, let's say, financial derivatives offered by the business school. A student of, let's say, international affairs might want to take up a course from the law school on UN and lawmaking. A student of public policy might want to take up a course on urban planning from our art and architecture school. A student who wants to major in business and psychology from our liberal arts school might want to take up a number of courses, not only from the business school, but also one of our institutes of behavioral sciences. The fourth cornerstone of our university is that of being global. Global is literally our middle name. How do we achieve this? We achieve this by ensuring that faculty members who come in and teach at OP General Global University have, on the most part, some international experience. For example, most of our faculty members have an international degree. Some have worked abroad as well. So that gives us an internationally exposed set of faculty members, and that international exposure comes into our classrooms. Our students also get the opportunity to go abroad. There are three primary ways our students can go abroad. 
The first is a short-term summer abroad program. These are programs that are typically two to three weeks long, and these take place during the summer break. We have, we have tied up and have engaged with a number of universities across the world, including University of California, Berkeley, Columbia, Harvard, Cambridge, as well as Oxford. And our students routinely go to these summer abroad programs. The second is a semester abroad. We have over 250 international collaborations across 52 countries. Close to 200 students go abroad every year on semester exchange. And these students go to all parts of the world, complete a semester there, and come back where we recognize the credits that they've earned in, the, in our partner universities. The third category of student mobility is that of a dual degree program. You start your studies here at OP General Global University, you spend a few years here, and then you go abroad for a few more years. For example, you may spend up to four years at OP General, at OP General Global University as part of a five-year law course, and then go abroad to one of our partner universities, such as Cornell, and spend two years there as a law student within their law school, and at the end, you end up with a dual qualification in India as well as the United States. Of course, do bear in mind that to practice law, you will have to clear the bar exam in both places. This is about the university vision and the cornerstones on which our university is built on, and this is our, about our Global Connect. Um, we have a few other questions on, um, on what courses we have. Well, we have, as of now, 21 courses across nine schools. Um, we have in the law school, let's start with the law school, we have the BA LLB program, this is a five-year integrated program, the BBA LLB program as well, a three-year LLB program, a one-year LLM program, and this year we're starting a three-year BA in legal studies. To know more about these programs, please do visit our websites. The business school was started in 2010. It presently has a five-year integrated business management program that's a BBA and an MBA, a three-year BBA program, and a two-year MBA program. Our School of International Affairs has a program in, a, a bachelor's program in global affairs, a bachelor's program in political science. This is the first time we're starting a program in, in political science. The master's program in diplomacy, law, and business. And um, this is the first time anywhere in India that a program specifically devoted to diplomacy, law, and business has come up. The Jindal School of Public Policy has four programs, two undergraduate and two postgraduate. The two undergraduate programs are a standard BA in economics and a BA in social science and policy. The BA in social science and policy is being started again for the first time this year. On the postgraduate side, the JSGP, the General School of Governance and Public Policy, has a program on public policy, as well as we're starting a new program this year, an MA in economics. Our General School of Liberal Arts and Humanities runs a three-year program in Liberal Arts and Humanities. This is known for the wide number of majors that we offer, as well as the idea of designing your own major. We started the General School of Journalism and Communication, which offers a course in journalism and media studies. This is again a three-year undergraduate program. The General School of Banking and Finance offers a three-year course on, on BCom. However, you should know that this is a BCom like any other. There's, we have tied up with ENY and a, a number of other external industry consultants, and there's a strong focus on technology, artificial intelligence, and blockchain issues that have never been, been questioned on issues that have never come up in a standard traditional BCom. We also have the Jindal School of Art and Architecture, which has two courses. One is the Bachelor of Architecture, this is a five-year program, as well as a three-year program, a Bachelor of Arts in the Built Environment Studies. Finally, we're starting the Jindal School of Environment and Sustainability, which will offer a BA in Environmental Studies. This is again going to be a three-year program, and um, we'll focus purely on environmental studies, on environmental policy, on climate change. 
these are the courses that we have in the university. Of course, there's also a university-wide PhD program. And of course, we, we welcome your applications at any time. Um, we're also getting more questions on internships, placement opportunities. Um, so most of our students go on internships every, every summer break, every winter break. Different schools have different requirements. Most schools require that in a three-year in a three-year program that they have at least two internships. There is a dedicated internships and placement cell, the Office of Career Services. And for further details, do visit our website as to where our students have gone. Our students work at top-notch law firms, not just in India, but across the world. Uh, some of them are working at Amazon, at Google, at ENY, at Deloitte, and, and will go on to um, be leaders in their own field. There's one thing that I've noticed in, at OP General Global University. We tend to have a very entrepreneurial startup culture. I'm assuming many of you have, have um, seen um, or seen advertisements or have seen the products of Sleepy Owl, right, at various stores. Now, Sleepy Owl is India's first cold brew company. Guess what? It was started by our very old alumni, Arman Su. We've had a number of other startups that have been incubated at OP General Global University. I remember one of my students, Mohit Yadav, and he was doing a course with me on mergers and acquisitions. And he figured out that part of the due diligence that a corporate lawyer is required to do can be automated. Now, he was a, he was a techie as well. He knew how to code. So he, once he, once he graduated from the General Global Law School, he went ahead and started his own legal startup, which uses artificial intelligence and technology to get data about companies from publicly available information. Now, these are the kind of students that we attract. These are the kind of students that we graduate and send out into the world. There seems to be a lot of, um, a, a lot of entrepreneurial spirit and a lot of startup culture that we have at OP General Global University. Um, we have a number of questions on what is the kind of research and the kind of research centers that we have. We have about 55 to 60 odd research centers all working in interdisciplinary studies. Each of these research centers are manned by our faculty members and they often bring out reports from time to time. For example, we bring out a report on the state of the economy every year. This is done through the, the General School of, of Governance and Public Policy. Most of our faculty members publish across um, leading journals in the world, including the Harvard Law Review, including the Business Ethics Review, and so on and so forth. Um, let's take a few other questions that are, um, that are pretty, all right. People are asking me for career advice. What is the best career advice that you've received? Well, the best career advice I've received and something that I tell my students and all students at OP General Global University is that use your internships wisely. Someone once told me, and I forget who it is, someone once told me that when you're at an internship, you'll have to leave at some point of time. Make them miss you. Make them miss you when you leave. For the right reasons, of course, right? So when you put in enough effort and hard work into an internship and then you leave, the people who you worked with, they miss you. And that leads to a number of opportunities, a number of career opportunities, a number of placement opportunities, all right? I'm just going through a few of the questions to see which are popular um, questions that are coming up. All right, I have a couple of questions coming in um, talking about whether we should pursue degrees um, based on technology and um, having a technical edge or should we stick to mainstream degrees? Um, look, the decision is entirely up to you, right? Whether you think you have a better aptitude for a, 
a degree based on technology or a degree based on social sciences, arts, and humanities. But I will tell you this, Jack Ma was a liberal arts major. Steve Jobs, liberal arts major. Elon Musk, liberal arts, right? Studies have shown that while people with engineering degrees um, start their careers at a higher pay package, by the time you turn 30 or 40, it is liberal arts, social sciences majors who actually outpace them, right? Uh, he can actually earn more money than engineers, right? Um, I have a few more questions coming in. What are the main things that we are looking for in students? Well, um, Varenya Subramaniam asked this question. What are the main things that we look for in students? Um, let's just face it. The seven points in this webinar, that's exactly what we're looking for in students. We're looking for a sense of intellectual curiosity. We're looking for people who can question everything, including their faculty members. We're looking for people with imagination, with creativity, with some element of ethics, some element of, of, of moral practice, right? Of course, um, this might be a good time to talk about our, our admissions uh, process. And um, you know, it's important for whoever's listening to note uh, a few changes in our admissions process. We understand that in the present situation of a lockdown, we cannot go out of our houses to save both ourselves and the people we love and care around us. At this point of time, I should tell you that our admissions process involves four steps. The first, logging onto our website and um, starting your application. Once your application is completed, we then move to the JSAT, the Jindal Scholastic Aptitude Test. Please note that the JSAT is not applicable for PG students, is not applicable for law students, and is not applicable for B ARC students. These students, PG, law, and B ARC, they will have a separate exam. For details, please again visit our websites. Um, the JSAT exam is an exam that is proctored at test centers run by Pearson View across the country and across the world. At this point of time, it is impossible to step out of our houses to go and give an exam. Having said that, that is the second step of our admissions process. The third step is conducting a faculty interaction where the faculty member and you will engage with each other in a conversation. And finally, your class 12 results. Again, given the current scenario that we're in, given the current uh, situation of a lockdown and global pandemic that we're in, we are doing away with the requirement of the JSAT as of now. We have moved to a rolling admissions process whereby if you complete your application and you engage with the faculty in a faculty interaction, we will be rolling out provisional admission letters conditional upon completion of the JSAT and your class 12 board results by the time our university reopens in fall 2020. Again, we are moving from rolling admission, we are moving from JSAT based admissions to rolling admissions where you can give your JSAT exam at a different, at a different time after the lockdown opens, um, after this, this entire pandemic and this, and this uh, issue of, of uncertainty is, is, is behind us. As of now, if you complete your application online and you go through the faculty interaction, we are willing to roll out provisional conditional offer letters. We are very, very mindful of the fact that in these dark and dangerous times, universities must play a balancing role and must ensure that students are not hampered in their careers, in their higher education in any way. Uh, we're getting a couple of um, questions on scholarships. Um, we follow, we have a means come merit system of scholarships. Um, we effectively take the student's performance in the, uh, in the application, in the faculty interaction, in the JSAT or the um, examination that is coming in, um, the, the qualifying examination. We look at the class 12 board results. We also look at the parents' means. We also look at your parents' um, income tax returns to figure out how much you, uh, your household earns 
And based on both of these factors, means and merit, we, we give a large number of scholarships to a large number of students. Um, let's look. All right. Wonderful. All right, we, we have a question on business data analytics uh, from Kabir Singh. Um, and, and Kabir Singh asks, do you think degrees like business data analytics will take an uprise, upward rise in the future? I believe so. Most decisions nowadays that companies are taking are based on data. And without having that data, um, businesses simply you know, don't take decisions. Um, it is important to figure out what kind of data needs to be captured, what kind of processes need to be applied to that data, and how it is to be presented to senior management. For this, you might you might argue um, you might argue that um, this can be done by artificial intelligence. But who chooses what data? Who sets up the process? It will always be people who will have some background in business data analytics. And I see this as a major career for the future. Um, I have a question, I have a number of questions on, on digital education. Um, and the number of people are asking whether interpersonal classes will end and there will be more digital education classes and MOOCs in the future. I'm given to understand that most of you, whether you're in school or you know, pursuing um, a college degree, most of you would have moved to an online classroom. Can you tell the difference? I don't know if you can, I can tell the difference. When I'm teaching my students online, I can tell the difference between a classroom education and an online education, right? The interaction between faculty and students is far in my view. And please, you are entitled to have your opinion and I will respect your opinion. In my view, the interaction and the engagement between faculty and students is far greater in a common space like a classroom as opposed to through a webcam, right? I wish I could have had all of you in, in an auditorium here and I could have spoken to all of you in person. Unfortunately, that is not possible as of this moment and we have to rely on, um, on technology. But to answer that question, I don't see an end for interpersonal classes. Yes, there are plenty of wonderful courses out there on edX, on, on, on Unacademy, on Udacity, on Coursera, on Upgrad, which, which all you can take. However, that doesn't take away from the fact that two people engaging in conversation face to face and in an exchange of ideas, in an exchange of beliefs, in an exchange of knowledge, that will remain the domain of interpersonal classes within a traditional university or within a traditional education setup. I'm looking at a few more um, questions. There seem to be a number of questions about um, journalism. Um, as, as, a, as a career, I can I can say with all my with all my gumption that journalism will remain as a career, and it is a fantastic career to have. Let's just examine what does journalism mean: the discovery of facts and the presentation of these facts. Now, is that a skill that you'd like to have, even if you're not planning to be a journalist? Is that a transferable skill? The discovery of facts. Now, when you're discovering facts, you're again, you're going back to assuming nothing, right? And when you're assuming nothing, and you start at nothing, you start collecting data. And then you verify that data, you look for evidence, you look for clues whether that data is true, is it accurate, right? I realize we have a lot of questions for JSJC. I'd like you to know that the faculty members at JSJC, most of them have had some experience in the industry. For example, um, one of our faculty members, the vice dean of JSJC, had spent a number of years 
in Naxalbari reporting on the plight of villagers there. Another faculty member was a news anchor for NDTV Profit. The dean of the journalism school had been a, the, the dean of the journalism school both at Columbia University as well as um, at Berkeley. Um, we have had a number of um, we've had a number of news reports, um, a number of news channels, a number of media agencies on campus. Uh, for example, Al Jazeera, BBC, they uh, their representatives have come on our campus and they've trained our students. We have a fully fledged TV and radio recording studio where students are required to carry out um, their semester long projects to, to, to create TV and radio content. All right. Um, we have a few more questions on um, campus experience. Oh, I wish, I wish you could visit our campus, right? I wish you could. Um, it's green, it's clean, and it's wonderful. The weather is brilliant here, but unfortunately, not before April 14th at the very least, and we'll hope it stays that way. Our campus, we live, eat, pray, work, learn, study, we do it all together. Most of our faculty members are live either on campus or within five minutes driving distance, which means that the student faculty interaction takes place at odd hours of the day and even at night. It's not unusual for a faculty member to schedule tutorial meetings at let's say 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night. And you'd often have students calling up faculty members and saying, hey, professor, um, I have a doubt. Um, are you on campus? Can I come see you? And the faculty member goes, well, I'm having dinner. Why don't you join me in the, in the common mess? Scenes like this are very much around at OP General Global University. Um, and because all eight schools live and work together, and all of these 5,100 students work and live together, we have a, a diverse uh, set of students that come from all parts of India and some, and, and some from different parts of the world. These students, Again, when they engage with each other, it calls for a multicultural experience that OP General Group University gives. In terms of cultural activities, we have over 50 clubs and societies. I myself, I used to play the guitar and I used to sing one of my pastimes. I myself am the faculty advisor for the music society. We have a vibrant music cultural campus, a performing arts society, a theater society. We have a social service society, human rights, sports. Let's talk about sports. We have a fully, fully functional cricket field, two football fields, basketball courts, volleyball courts, tennis courts, and even an Olympic sized swimming pool. Um, we have a couple of questions on personality building. Um, personally, I would, I would say that let your experiences define your personality. We, of course, have a number of courses on campus offered by the Jindal Institute of Behavioral Sciences that help develop personality, that help uh, develop public, public speaking skills, that help develop um, competencies. Um, and I'm sure that if you look up the website of the Jindal Institute of Behavioral Sciences, you would be able to uh, find out what you, it is you're looking for. Um, let's look at a few more questions. We have a few more um, questions on media. And there's one very interesting question on how to remove partisanship in today's media. In short, um, I don't think you can. I don't think any, um, any effort uh, would be able to remove partisanship in India unless if there is a regulatory effort, which I don't see coming anytime soon. But there's one way we can we can disallow that partisanship. Again, going back to figuring out for ourselves as to what is true and what is not. And this quest for the truth from different media channels that might present to you the same facts differently or may choose to omit facts entirely, may choose to omit the entire story, right? While other news outlets will not. And it is our job as media consumers, and it is your job, budding journalists who are listening to this, it is our job 
to use these facts in a holistic manner to figure out what is the truth. And it's your job, future journalists, to present the facts in a holistic manner as the whole story. All right, we have a few questions on our teaching pedagogy. And how does the Jindal teaching, teaching pedagogy help us to develop critical thinking and other basic tools which are important in all of these careers? Well, to begin with, we have we've adopted the case study method that is used in Harvard, which is used across the world. This has been a very successful method of teaching where students are given the facts of a case, students are given the situation, and then are asked to figure out what could be an appropriate solution. So now what students have to do is go back to the basics to figure out, okay, what is the situation about? And how can it be changed? Right now, the moment you ask the question, what is the situation about? You are engaging in intellectual curiosity. You are asking for more data. You're asking for more facts. How can we change it? That is an analytical exercise where you will need to use the tools that your faculty member would have given you to come to an appropriate solution. Again, our, our pedagogy is very much Socratic, which means that we keep, as faculty members, we keep asking questions to the students until they get the right answer. It's not a one-way street here. Faculty and students engage in a conversation rather than a lecture. It is more seminar style rather than a dictation of notes. Right. So that element of engagement with students, of intellectual engagement with students, is really, really critical for our teaching pedagogy. Ah, right. The future of global affairs. A lot of you have been asking about the future of global affairs. As we speak, the U.S. and parts of the U.S. are going under lockdown. Or as my as our faculty members who are right now in the U.S. are telling me, they call it a travel advisory. Many of our friends and family members in the United States are already under self-quarantine and production is slowing to a halt. What does this mean for foreign affairs? And what does, what do issues or what do uh, challenges like the corona pandemic, what, do they, what, what does it mean for, 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 for the future of global affairs? I say immense. Global affairs as a career, I believe, will be set to rise. Countries need to talk to each other. Countries need to engage with each other and not engage in mere trade wars that US and China have been at for many months now. There are a number of career options for people who take up the Bachelor of Arts in Global Affairs offered at the Jindal School of International Affairs. For example, we've got a number of our alumni working in embassies and policy centers providing backup or, or back-end research work for policy makers and, 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 and politicians to make international relations policies for India and across the world. I'd say the future of global affairs looks bright as long as, as more and more as we move towards a more globalized world, a more interconnected world. Uh, let's have a few other questions. Now we have a lot of questions about journalism which have been answered. Um, yeah, a lot of questions on international relations as well. I hope we've um, All right. Um, I have a few more questions on um, the admissions process. Just to let you guys know again that we have changed our admissions process. We no longer require you to take, if you are, uh, uh, if, if you are an aspirant that is not in law, not PG, and not um, Bachelor of Architecture, we require you to take the JSAT exam. 
we are doing away with it for now. You may apply for the JSAT exam at a later stage. Again, we've changed our admissions process. If you fill out our application form and complete the faculty interaction, we are willing to roll out admissions offers on a provisional and conditional basis conditional upon completion of the JSAT at a later stage, at a later date, and your class 12 results. Please note again, this does not apply to law students. This does not apply to PG students. This does not apply to students aspiring to be to, to come into our Bachelor of Architecture. Um, that's all the time we have today. Uh, we were about, we we're about five minutes left. And, um, you know, we're always available to talk. And, um, and our admissions counselors, you'll have their numbers on our websites, you'll have their email addresses on, on our websites. If you have any questions that you feel I should have answered and I didn't, again, I'm very, very sorry. We try to answer as many questions as we can, and we try to club together as many questions as we can. But know this, that we will have more and more webinars as we go along, as we, are, as we remain in a state of lockdown. I want to reach out to each one of you. I want to reach out to every person who is worried about their education, their higher education, whether you're looking to, to go abroad or, or study in India, I'd like to have more of these conversations with each and every one of you. Um, again, our admissions counselors are always available to talk. They're always available on email and a recorded video of this will be sent to you. I had a number of questions asking, can you please send us a recorded version of this video? I will send this to you shortly. Um, that's all the time we have. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, and again, please stay home, stay safe, stay healthy.